Hi friends! Today I'm going to be wrapping up all the reading that I did in the month of July. If you're new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that I do these is I start by talking about all of my stats for the month. I'm a stats nerd. I like to see how I'm doing with some of my goals and just generally how things go from month to month. So I'll cover that. And then I will talk about all the books that I read this month, starting with my DNFs, then my lowest rated books, moving all the way up to my highest rated books. Some of these books I have talked about more in detail in other videos, such as my mid-month wrap-up. So I will link my mid-month wrap-up up above, as well as tell you where some of those other videos are. For the books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up, I'm just going to be telling you the title and the star rating, and if you want to hear more details, you can check out that video. Overall, I feel like it was a pretty strong reading month. I was surprised when I saw how many books I ended up reading this month, especially considering the fact that I went on vacation. I felt like I wasn't reading as much as usual, but then I looked at my number of audiobooks <laughs> and I was like, aha, this makes so much more sense. Basically, I listened to a lot more audiobooks than I typically do, and so that took up a higher percentage of my reading this month than usual. We're going to get into all of it right now with my statistics. In the month of July, I read 37 books for a total of 12,595 pages, which does include my audiobooks. That is about 406 pages a day. So I was reading a lot. I was listening to a lot of audiobooks, and I guess I'm kind of surprised. It's interesting because I felt like I wasn't reading as much as usual because I was reading far fewer ebooks and physical books, especially ebooks than usual. I usually get through a lot more ebooks than I did this month, but things were just really busy with the kids and audiobooks in times like that really work for me. This also made me go back and look at how many books I've read each month of the year so far, and I was kind of surprised. I hadn't realized every single month of 2021 I've read over 30 books, which I think that's the first time that that's happened. Last year I had some months where I was more in the 20s, but this year it's just consistently been really high. I'm not necessarily trying to do that or trying to hit like some target number every month, but that seems to be what's happening. On this month I had one book that I DNF'd, three of the books that I read were indie published titles, I had one reread, 16 of the books that I read were either ARCs or books that were sent to me for review, ARC stands for advanced reader copy, I did not read any translated fiction this month, and I read three graphic novels. Looking at the age breakdown of the books that I read, unsurprisingly most of the books that I read were for adults, 25 of them were targeted at an adult audience, six of them were targeted at a YA audience, and unusually six of them were also targeted at a middle grade audience. I don't don't typically read a ton of middle grade books, but this month I had an entire reading vlog dedicated to reading middle grade fantasy, which I'll link up above if you haven't seen it yet. That was actually really fun and I think it reminded me how much I enjoy middle grade fantasy when I do pick it up and I really should read more of it. So that was that was a good time. You'll remember I said I listened to a lot of audiobooks. This month 20 of the books that I read <laughs> were audiobooks. <laughs> so I had 17 physical and ebooks. 20 audiobooks, a lot of audiobooks. Uh, 13 of those were what I term shelf, which means I had a physical copy of the book on my TBR shelf and got it off via audio, which is actually great. I kind of inadvertently ended up listening to audiobooks from a bunch of things that had just been kind of sitting on my TBR. In terms of where those audiobooks were coming from, this month seven of them were from my library, three of them were from Scribd, three of them were from Audible, Three of them were audio review copies from the Penguin Random House Volumes app. One of them was an audio review copy from NetGalley. Two of them were influencer review copies from Libro FM. And as always, you can check them out in the link down below if you're interested. Some of their proceeds go to support indie bookstores, which is great. And adding a brand new thing to my list of places I'm listening to audiobooks this month, one of my audiobooks was from Chirp. Chirp is a platform where you can get deals on audiobooks. It could be dangerous for you if you're an audiobook listener and tend to buy things. I've actually been pretty good about it. I haven't bought a ton of books from there, but I've bought a few and sometimes you'll get really great deals on things you're looking for. So if you're interested in getting good deals on audiobooks and you are an audio listener, you might want to check out Chirp. This isn't sponsored or anything, but I found out about it from Shay over at Shay Geeks Out and here we go. First one from Chirp, so add that to the, my list of stats. 
Moving on, let's look at when the books I read were being published. This month, the earliest publication date was 1981. I read 14 books that were published prior to 2020, six books published in 2020, and 17 2021 releases, so books released in this year. In terms of author demographics, this month was pretty good. 49% of the books that I read were by white non-Jewish authors. 49% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, or person of color authors. You can see the breakdown in the chart here. And 1% from white Jewish authors. I'm pretty happy with that. This year my goal has been to try to hit around 50% of my reading being from Black, Indigenous, or person of color authors. This month I was pretty on target, so that's great. And in the month of July, 19% of the books that I read were written by queer authors, members of the LGBTQIA plus community, and my typical goal for that is 25%. However, last month I read like 40 something percent queer authors for Pride Month, so I'm, I'm good with 19%. Moving on, let's look at genre. It was a little bit of an interesting month. Unsurprisingly, my top two genres this month were fantasy and romance, as they usually are. I read 12 fantasy books and eight romance. In terms of subgenres, six of those were contemporary romance and two of them were historical romance. I didn't read any speculative romance this month. But then my next highest category was contemporary fiction. I read seven of those, which is not usually a very large category in my reading, so I just thought that was kind of interesting. I also read two sci-fi, two horror, two thrillers, one historical fiction, one literary fiction, one mystery, and one nonfiction. So good mix of things there. Next let's look at star ratings. I liked but didn't love a lot of the things that I read this month. This month I did not give any books one star or one and a half stars. I gave two books two stars. I did not give out any two and a half star ratings. Six books got three stars, one book got three and a half stars, 12 books got four stars. I feel like four stars is often my most given out rating, and that was certainly true this month. Six books got four and a half stars, eight books got five stars, and this month two books got six stars. And six stars is what I give to a favorite of the year. So this month I had two books that I loved enough to give a six star rating. Lastly, we can look at some of my reading goals that I set for myself at the beginning of the year. Uh, basically nothing has changed from last month. I have not made any more progress on these challenges. Hopefully next month I can make a little more progress. So those are the stats. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into all of the books that I read. I guess I should say one of the books that I read this month I'm not going to be telling you about in this video because it's for a secret TBR project that will be coming out next month. So um, you will be hearing about 36 books from me today um, as an FYI. But first we're going to talk about my DNFs. This month I had one book that I DNFed and I did talk about it in my mid-month wrap-up. So if you want to hear more details on it I'm going to direct you there. This was a disappointment though because it was a highly anticipated book for me and unfortunately just really wasn't working out for me. This is Isn't It Bromantic by Lissa K. Adams. So I'll direct you there if you want to hear more details or you can check out my Goodreads review. I do review the books I DNF even though I don't rate them. But I will say take it with a grain of salt because a lot of other people seem to be enjoying it a lot more than I did. Next let's talk about my two star reads. This month there were two of them and one of them I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up. That was The Gunslinger by Stephen King. Not my favorite but I am intrigued to continue on in the series so I'm gonna at least try the next book and see how I get on with it. This was a buddy read with Lana's library and we're gonna be reading The Drawing of the Three in August. The other book that I gave two stars to is part of this bind up Pride and Passion by Nora Roberts. The book that I read from this was Irish Thoroughbred and I read this for the Reading Roberts readathon hosted by my friend Mara over at Books Like Whoa. This was actually her debut novel. It's a Harlequin category romance from the 1980s which I mean if you know my channel you know this is probably not going to be my deal and indeed it was just it was not my thing. It wasn't terrible. I feel like you can definitely see the seeds of Nora Roberts writing and the things that I've really enjoyed from her in her current stuff but I think for me there was just too much of 80s tropiness with like a super aggressive hero who's like forcing kisses on her and like treating her like a girl. I don't know. I just it wasn't it wasn't my thing. So I gave it two stars but I have definitely enjoyed a lot of more modern things from Nora Roberts. I think I'm gonna unhaul this bind up. There is another book in it but Mara read it for the readathon and she liked it even less than Irish Thoroughbred so I'm like if you didn't like it that much I'm definitely not gonna like it so I think I'm just gonna take that one. 
off my TBR and instead pick up some other Nora Roberts that I think I would enjoy a little bit more. Next let's talk about my three star reads. This month there were six of them. One of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up and one of them is the book that I can't tell you about so sneak peek at a rating from a forthcoming video, not that you know what it is. The one that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up was Dial A for Aunties by Jessie Q. Sutanto. Check out that video if you want to hear more details. Basically I think this was fine but a little too wacky for me to really love it. Like three stars isn't a bad rating, it's just like it was fine. Like you know, I liked things about it, I didn't love everything about it, you can hear more in that other video. I also gave three stars to uh, Declaration of the Rights of Magicians by H.G. Perry and this is a book that I struggled with a little bit. I actually was sent this for review very kindly from Orbit Books and uh, I feel kind of bad because they sent me this and the second book in the duology. After reading this I don't think I can continue. I think this is really not my cup of tea. I think that while this is going to definitely have an audience and there are people who would love this, I it was just not really my cup of tea. It has really great ideas but I found a lot of the writing to be kind of tedious. I am instead going to send these books off to my friend Leanna at Leanna's Library because I think she would really enjoy them and I'm hoping that that will kind of like get them out to people who would enjoy them more than I did. Like I said, the concept is really interesting. This is historical fantasy. So it's set very firmly in the late 1700s and follows real life historical figures except in a world where there is magic. It follows three kind of major things. You have the French Revolution in France obviously. In England you're following the fight for the abolition of slavery and then eventually going to war with France. The two perspective characters in the England narration are William Pitt and William Wilberforce which is pretty interesting. Uh, like I, I do think the idea of taking these real historical figures and bringing them to life is really fascinating. I just think that in practice her approach to writing it didn't work for me super well. And then the third sort of timeline or place that we're looking at is the slave rebellion in Haiti. So it's interesting. It's in this world where magic is used as a tool of oppression. Commoners are not allowed to use magic and magic is also used to control the enslaved. So um, I, like I think she's doing some really interesting things here. It's just that it's so glacially slow, very descriptive, takes a long long time to build up to things. And I like a slow burn, I like a character driven story, but e this was too much even for me. It has been recommended though for fans of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which I actually haven't read because <laughs> it's so long and a lot of people who really loved this book or this series seem to also be fans of that which makes me think I'm gonna stick with just having seen the miniseries of it. You know this reminds me a lot of my feelings about Charles Dickens actually where I feel like his books have great plots and characters and I like seeing adaptations of them but I find the experience of reading his writing to be kind of tedious there are people who love him which is great but that's my experience with it and I had kind of a similar experience with this. So the thing with a review like this is I feel like some of you are gonna say that sounds right up my alley. It she did a ton of, she clearly did a ton of research into the history here so there are people who are gonna love this. It is a duology, it's a Finnish duology and I think part two is the Napoleonic era which which is interesting but I just think I struggled so much to get through this. I'm going to send them off. I want to say thank you to Orbit and send them off to my friend who I think will enjoy them a lot more than me. So um, yeah, some of you might be into this, but just an FYI, it wasn't quite what I was hoping for. All right, my next three star read is one that I feel a little bit bad about because this was the concluding volume in a indie published sci-fi trilogy that I was highly anticipating. I really liked book one, I loved book two, and I think in my head I had expectations of what I was hoping for from the story in book three and that's really just not the direction that it took. Which is fine, like the author can choose to take things in whatever direction she wants to do. It's just that for me that direction was less in line with my personal preferences with storytelling. So this is Connection by J.E. Perazzi. It's a cyberpunk sci-fi series that has like aliens and really great characters. I think that's the thing is that 
what I loved about book two is that it had a heavier focus on politics and on character development and character interactions and that was what I really wanted more of from this book. Instead this book is much more of like a high octane action-packed survival on an alien planet type thriller thing with some of the moments that I was looking for with the character interactions but just not as much as I wanted. I was also hoping that this book was going to go in the direction of being more about politics, about creating a new civilization on this planet and that's just not where the story went. So um, you know like maybe on me for having the wrong expectations of the story but it wasn't quite what I was hoping for so I gave it three stars. I do think that as a whole the series is great and she's doing some really interesting things. The world building on the alien planet was kind of cool. She had a lot of interesting flora and fauna ideas that were explored and I really enjoyed that part of it. I was sent this for a review from the author so thank you so much to her. I think she's a wonderful person in general and I would definitely read more from her in the future. Then I read an e-arc from NetGalley of an anthology that I had a very mixed experience with and so I ended up landing on three stars. This was Living Beyond Borders edited by Margarita Longoria. It's a mixed media anthology about growing up Mexican-American. It's written for a YA audience and it's an interesting blend of fiction and nonfiction. There's some stories, there's some personal essays, there's some comics, some poetry. I really like the project of this and I think there are some fantastic pieces in it that are really great and interesting that deal with identity and representation and the experience of being Mexican American. I love what the project is doing and like I said like some of the installments are great. Some of them are fine like any kind of in any anthology especially with so many contributors you're always going to connect more with some things than others that's pretty normal. But I had a couple of like specific issues. One is with a particular story that I will talk about in a minute and the other thing is more of a structural issue. I found it a little bit difficult at times to figure out whether something was fiction or nonfiction. Sometimes you can figure it out through the process but a lot of times I was left kind of wondering like okay is this an essay? Is this a story? Like I'm not really sure and unfortunately there's no way to tell in the book. Typically with an anthology like this I would expect at either the beginning or the end of the piece to get a few sentences about the author, about the piece and why they wrote it, what it is, etc. But you don't get any of that, it's just all kind of put together. At the end of the book there are author bios but there's no reference to the pieces they submitted for the anthology and so I think that's definitely a weakness of the collection and I wish that that had been handled a little bit differently. The other thing though is there is a particular story that I, 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 it made some choices and I'm like not sure why. I'm not sure what those choices added to the story in a collection for teenagers and I just want to make people aware of it. So there's a story about a teen girl who is going on vacation with her extended family. Her dad recently left them, her mom has been grieving it and to try to help get her mom out of this rut they're going on vacation with some extended family. There's some family drama that happens but the main thing I want to focus on is that going along is the, her male cousin and a lot of the story is us being in the head of the heroine being attracted to her cousin uh, and thinking about it a lot and it's like very very uncomfortable and like she knows she shouldn't be but she still is and then near the end of the story they almost kiss each other until they're interrupted by family who are like incest ah this is terrible um but like why though like what did that add to I don't I don't really understand so that was interesting like an interesting choice FYI. So I landed on three stars for the anthology. I think there's some really fantastic pieces in it. I like the project of it but there are some things that could have been better. The last three star read that I can talk about here is Year One by Nora Roberts and I'm actually not gonna say too much about this one because we did an in-depth conversation over on Mara's channel for the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club this month. Suffice to say I had kind of mixed feelings on this. I feel like if you're going into this because you want good fantasy and world building don't because like the magic system doesn't really make sense and there's a lot of holes in like the world building and stuff. Um, also this book definitely hits different reading it post COVID rather than when it initially came out I imagine because this is basically about a global pandemic that kills a 
ton of people except it ends up being magical and so I was like wow <laughs> like this is this is interesting it's kind of a lot I think there were too many characters and some of them I was not really interested in I think this would have been better because what I like from Nora Roberts is her characters and I think if this had focused on fewer characters it would have worked better for me and I wouldn't have been as like annoyed by some of the holes in the magical world building stuff so this was interesting. I don't think I'm going to continue on with the series, but I know Mara is. If you want to hear more in-depth thoughts, check out our live stream where we talked about it for the book club. Moving on, I had one book this month that got three and a half stars, and that was Her Land, Her Love by Evangeline Parsons Yazzie. I read this for the Indigenous Romance Read Along, and I will link the live show for that up above if you want to hear me and Michelle discuss it more in depth. I was not expecting this book to be so intense. Um, I, like, I don't want to go into a lot of detail here. This was interesting in terms of the stylistic choices. It's a romance slash family saga that is historical, and it deals with the long walk, uh, follows Navajo characters, and it really goes some dark places. And so on the one hand, I do think the central couple's love story is really, really beautiful and made me very emotional. I had big feelings about it, but also this was very difficult to read. It deals quite graphically with a lot of things that happened in this historical time period, including forms of abuse, sexual assault, uh, deprivation. Like it, it was, it was rough. It was difficult, difficult to read, but I do think there is a lot that's important here. Again, if you want to hear more in-depth discussion, I'd recommend checking out the live show, but I did give this one three and a half stars and round it up to a four on Goodreads. Moving on, let's talk about my four star reads. This month there were 12 of them and four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books were An Offer from a Gentleman by Julia Quinn, Arsenic and Adobo by Mia P. Manansalas, Imposter Syndrome by Kathy Wang, and The Girl with Stars in Her Eyes by Zio Axelrod. If you want to hear about any of those books, check out my mid-month wrap-up. Um, I have been trying to get through some of my back titles that I've gotten from Book of the Month Club, and I got through a bunch this month, which feels very satisfying. I also gave four stars to Keeper of the Lost Cities Exile by Shannon Messenger, and this is a book that I read for my middle grade fantasy reading vlog, so I'm not going to talk much about it here. If you want to hear more about this book and the other books that I read, I'm going to direct you to the video linked up above. But briefly, I'll just say that I largely enjoyed this. I think these are really fun to read, and as huge as they look, I breeze right through them. So I'm enjoying them. They have sort of like a hidden world portal fantasy type thing where a girl had been raised human but now knows she's an elf. This I would say is like late middle grade early YA in terms of age range. It's like on the higher end of middle grade and it's fun. There's got a lot of po politics and twists and turns and teen drama and crushes and whatnot so it was fun. I also gave four stars to Half Sick of Shadows by Laura Sebastian. So this is an interesting book because my friend Liana just read it this month and she was not a fan um, and talking through it with her I think there were a few reasons for that, but I do think part of it might have been her expectations going into this book. So let me try to set your expectations so if you go to read it, you kind of know what you're getting and what you're not. So this is the adult fantasy debut of this author. In the past, she's written YA fantasy. This book is targeted more at adults, and it is kind of a retelling or reimagining of The Lady of Shalott and some of the like Arthurian legends. A few things that you should know about what this is and isn't. One is it is not historically accurate at all. Like it's not trying to be part of a historical time period. It's like a vaguely historical fantasy world that feels like a mashup of time periods. So if that's going to irritate you, <laughs> like FYI, it's more about like vibes. The other thing I think to know about this is that Laura Sebastian cares the most about the female characters in the story, and I've seen her on social media talk about this as like the real housewives of Camelot, which is kind of funny having read this. I think the biggest takeaway from this is she wanted to take this character, the Lady of Shalott, who was always stuck in her tower and like had a cruel fate and didn't have any agency in her own life and kind of do a what if scenario of like, what if she had more agency? What if she came down from her tower? What if she found ways to cope with these very difficult visions and things that she was dealing with? What might that look like? And so that's a lot of what the story is. She also sort of complicates 
figures of villains like Morgan Le Fay, and I enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. I didn't think it was a perfect book by any means, but also like my expectations going into this, having read some of her YA books, having seen her talk about it on social media as like, you know, Real Housewives of Camelot. I didn't expect something that was going to be deeply historical and literary. So just know it's not. So if you have very strong feelings about the Arthurian legends and historical accuracy, like this is not going to be your cup of tea. But if the vibes of what she's trying to do sounds interesting to you, maybe check it out. Do you know there's some content warnings which she mentions at the beginning of it for things like suicide and suicidal ideation. It does get kind of dark and emotional, um, but I, I largely enjoyed it. Then I read an e-arc of Who to F Are You by Huda Fahmi. This was really fun and funny. It's a YA graphic novel that's coming out this fall, I believe. It's like autobiographical fiction, so it's like loosely pulling on the experiences of the author, but also it's you know, somewhat fictionalized. It follows a Muslim teen girl named Huda who moves to a new town and a new school where instead of being like the only Muslim girl wearing hijab in her school, she's one of many. And like one of her sisters is kind of like, you know, wearing hijab is not a personality trait, right? And so she's having to kind of figure out what is her identity? Who is she when she had put so much of her identity just in this one thing that she does? who is she now? And uh, it's really fun and funny. It's a great coming of age story. And I think it's going to be a hit for a lot of people. So I gave that one four stars. I also gave four stars to Last Summer at the Golden Hotel by Alyssa Friedland. This was interesting. I had picked this up because people said it was kind of like dirty dancing dealing with like those hotels that people used to go to in the summer, except in this case, it's one for Jewish people. And that is kind of what it is. I like this is not the kind of book I would usually gravitate towards. I think it's a good version of what it is. It's just not like something I love to read, if that makes sense. Like it was, it was, it was good. Um, so it does follow a family of three different generations having to decide what to do with this hotel that they own that had been a big deal back in the day and now is kind of aging and like not as popular and has some issues and is falling apart and they have an offer for a buyout from a casino. And so there's dark family secrets that have been buried, they get dredged up, there's a lot of melodrama and family drama and stuff that like comes up through the process as they decide what they're going to do this last summer of the Golden Hotel. So there were things about it I enjoyed. I think it's well done. I think if this is the kind of thing that you like, you'll probably be really into it. I think I was hoping for something that was a little more romance heavy with the dirty dancing comparison. And I didn't really get that like there is kind of some romance, but it's not the focus. So I probably would have liked this better if it had focused more on the romances. Um, but yeah, so it was still good. It's funny, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing this sounds more negative than it is. I think this is the kind of book where like, I, I didn't have a lot negative to say about it. If I'm being honest, I probably gave it four stars because I think it is a well written version of what it is, you know, like in terms of enjoyment, for me, this was probably more like a three star. But like, it's doing what it does pretty well. So Okay. I also gave four stars to Piranesi by Susanna Clark. This is a book that I read for the small booktubers pick my TBR vlog, which I will link up above if you want to check that out. I'm not going to say too much about this here because I talk about it quite a lot in that vlog. But overall, I had a good experience reading this. It's really confusing at first, but eventually it all makes sense. I think it's really interesting. And I like all of the references. I do have some questions about some choices that she made towards the end of the book and with the characterization. Again, if you want to hear more, check out my Goodreads review or check out that other video. Then I gave four stars to Royal Assassin by Robin Hobb. Again, we've got a whole live show talking about it. So I will direct you there. Overall, I did enjoy this. And I think while reading this, I realized I've definitely read this book before. I had thought that I stopped partway through book two in the series. But now I'm thinking I probably stopped partway into book three in the series, because this was pretty familiar to me. I love Ketrican. There was a lot that I like about this. I think this was more of a four star because it took me a little while to get into it at the beginning, but it's like a high four. Um, yeah, really enjoyed it. Excited to continue on with the series. I know she's not for everyone, but I do think that she does 
what she does very very well. Two more. One I'm not even going to say much about. I listened to what amounts to an epilogue of a story that I read last year that was available for review from the Penguin Random House Volumes app and I just wanted to listen to it and it was fun. This is The Gravity of Us After the Launch by Phil Stamper. So last year I read and really loved The Gravity of Us which was a queer YA love story I thought it was fantastic. Um, and this is kind of like an epilogue a year later following those characters. And it was fun. If you've read the book, it's worth checking out. So my final four star read this month was an audio review copy from NetGalley of So Many Beginnings by Bethany C. Morrow, a remix of Little Women. So I really liked this a lot. I think the choices that Bethany C. Morrow made in retelling Little Women were really cool and really interesting. I may at some point do a whole video talking about this book or talking about this series, especially if I get approved for one of the later ones. I think these remixed classics are really interesting. They're inviting people of color to retell classic tales, but centering people of color. And I think this is if, if this is an example of what we're going to get, I'm very excited to see more. Little Women, if you didn't know, is set during the time around the Civil War. And this retelling is set in the South following a black family um, during the Civil War and Reconstruction era. And while it took me a little while to get into the swing of things, I think it's very good. I think it's faithful to the vibe and tone and prose style of the original. It does a fantastic job with the sister relationships and those dynamics. And the choices for changing things or mirroring things from the original with the characters were fun and interesting and smart. So I'm not going to get into that here because they might be considered a little bit spoilery, but I do talk about some of those things in my Goodreads review. So if you don't mind spoilers for like what she's changed and are curious, my Goodreads is always linked down below and you could go check that out. But I really liked this a lot. Not a completely perfect book, but a very, very strong retelling. And I'm excited to see what else we get from this series. Moving on, let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month there were six of them and three of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Love, Sugar, Magic, A Dash of Trouble by Anna Mariano. And for the record, I also read this for my reading middle grade fantasy reading vlog, if you want to see that. If the Shoe Fits by Julie Murphy, which I have pre-ordered a finished copy of. This was a e-arc from NetGalley and I was very into it. And The Good Sister by Sally Hepworth, which was our Patreon book club pick for the month. So all of those I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. I also gave four and a half stars to Champion's Quest, The Die of Destiny by Frank L. Cole. This is another book that I read for that middle grade fantasy reading vlog if you want to check it out. But I really enjoyed this a lot. And this is something that I want to pass along to my seven year old because I think this is something he would enjoy and get a kick out of and something I think would be appropriate for a seven or eight year old or older. Um, the basic premise of this is it follows a group of kids who inadvertently get sucked into a real life version of an RPG video game, sort of like a Dungeons and Dragons meets Dragon Age, except in real life with these kids. And it's super fun. If you're into gaming, especially, or you've played those kinds of video games, like I think you'll get a big kick out of some of the specific ways that they make that video game thing work in real life. I had a really good time with this. I thought it was a great book. Definitely would recommend checking it out. And this was sent to me for review from Shadow Mountain Publishing. I also gave four and a half stars to Whiskey Beach by Nora Roberts. This is the final book I read for the Reading Roberts readathon read uh, with Mara. And this was great. This is actually one that Mara bought for me and like hand selected for me. And she, it, it was it was a great pick. This is a cozy seaside small town romantic suspense that is just really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. The hero had been a lawyer, but when he was about to divorce his wife, he happened upon her dead body. And now they're accusing him of murder. And so to sort of escape scrutiny, he's gone off to the seaside town of Whiskey Beach and is staying in his grandmother's estate while she recovers elsewhere from an injury to try to write a novel. While there, he meets our heroine who part time works as sort of the housekeeper for the estate. But she's a, a woman of many talents and also is a yoga instructor and a massage therapist and like does all of these different things. And this is kind of a grumpy sunshine story where she's like very perky and happy and like quirky and he's kind of gruff and grumpy and there's like a mystery thing surrounding all of this. It was really fun. Like was I at all surprised by the way the plot went and the twists and the reveals? 
no, not even remotely, but I had a really good time getting there. So I definitely would recommend this and I would read more books like this from Nora Roberts in the future. And my final four and a half star read is something that I think has been highly anticipated for a lot of people this year and I think it's going to be a hit for those who are looking for this with some caveats. So I read A Lesson in Vengeance by Victoria Lee. This is a upper YA dark academia title that's coming out in August. I love dark academia. She talks about having taken inspiration from The Secret History by Donna Tartt, which I can see. Um, it's also super queer. The main characters are lesbians. And this was great. It took me a little while to get into it, like the early part. I, I have like some quibbles about the way that the beginning part of the book was structured, but once I was in, I was in. And this got so much darker than I was expecting from a YA book. Like it really it really goes some places and I was here for it. Um, do check content or trigger warnings if you need them because there's quite a lot for this book but it's set at an exclusive all girls boarding school. It's like witchy, it's got these uber intellectual girls who talk about highbrow literature and it's a lot of fun. So if you're looking for a good dark academia, spooky, witchy, murdery, gay book, might I suggest A Lesson in Vengeance. I think if that's what you want, it's going to be a hit. Uh, some people aren't loving it as much. And I like that's not shocking. People also are very hit and miss with secret history, I think for similar reasons. So it's a lot to talk about you guys. <laughs> I'm like, I feel like my camera is probably gonna overheat. It's gonna be a long one. Um, okay, five star reads. Moving on to my five star reads, there were eight of them, and three of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are NPR's Podcast Startup Guide by Glenn Weldon. This was an audio review copy from the Volumes app. The Killing Moon by N.K. Jemisin, which I read for the booktubers pick my TBR reading blog. And Where the Rhythm Takes You by Sarah Das, which was sent to me from the author for review. I loved it. It's a YA contemporary retelling of Persuasion by Jane Austen, and it's very good set in Tobago. So I won't say more about it here because I talked about it elsewhere, but I really liked this. I also gave five stars to Eva Evergreen's Semi-Magical Witch by Julie Abe. This is another one I read for the middle grade fantasy reading vlog, and this was super cute. If you like Kiki's Delivery Service or that kind of Studio Ghibli stuff, you'll probably be really into this. It's about a young witch with a pinch of magic who's trying to prove herself that she's capable of becoming a full witch, going on a quest to help a town in need, and it's really cute and funny and heartwarming, and I loved it. It was great. My other five-star read from that middle grade fantasy video was Pahua and the Soul Stealer by Lori M. Lee. This is coming out in September, and I had an advanced copy. I really love this. This is among my favorite installments in the Rick Riordan Presents series. This one is about Hmong culture and mythology, which is really interesting. It's not a people that I had known much about before. They're originally from China, but live throughout Southeast Asia, and uh, this was really great. So again, check out that video if you want to hear more thoughts on this, but I think this is a really, really strong one. I also gave five stars to New Kid by Jerry Craft. This is a middle grade graphic novel that I read for the booktubers, small booktubers pick my TBR video, and I thought it was very, very good. It's about a young black boy who is starting at a new school. He's going to middle school, and um, it's an elite school where he is in the minority and has dealing with having to fit in, code switching, microaggressions, and trying to make friends and kind of a coming of age story. I will say it's not super heavy, like while it does have moments that deal with um, more difficult topics, it keeps it relatively light and appropriate for a middle grade audience. And I just thought this was very, very good. I also gave five stars to Teach Me by Olivia Dade. I really, really loved this and I'm excited to be reading more of her backlist. I wanna keep going because this was just fantastic. Also, if you're looking for a good cinnamon roll hero, we have a cinnamon roll hero who's a teacher and a prickly heroine, which are my favorites, guys. I mean, this is like my perfect trope combo. We've got good fat representation with a prickly heroine and a cinnamon roll hero. They're teachers who care really deeply about their students. And this is definitely a love letter, I think, to teachers and what they do and the importance of the work that they do. It was great. 
I loved it. It made me really happy. The final book that I gave five stars to this month is actually a comic. This is The Low Low Woods by Carmen Maria Machado and Danny. I love this a lot. You might have possibly seen my little short that I made about this because I, I had some feelings. This is a piece of queer feminist horror and I loved it. Creepy moments that were very disturbing and uh, like great character development follows two queer women of color who are best friends living in a small town in Pennsylvania that used to be a coal mining town and now there's very strange things happening in it. This does get very very dark. I'm not going to talk about the content warnings in this video because they are spoilers but check out my Goodreads review if you need them because it's it's pretty intense but I loved this. What was interesting to me is after I wrote my review I went and looked through the reviews on Goodreads and it was fascinating to me because in most cases, not all, but like the vast majority of cases, you had women reviewing it and giving it four and five stars saying this was fantastic, I loved it, it's great, and most of the men giving it one or two stars saying like this wasn't very good, I didn't get it, I didn't think it was scary, and I'm like okay you know what though like honestly it's probably because it's like not for you it's not about you and your lived experience as a man means that different things might be scary for you like this is clearly a book that is centering the all right we're back i guess i was getting too heated because the camera over <laughs> overheated no it's fine it happens in the summer a lot i think what i was saying was just that I find it interesting the way that the reviews went on this because this is clearly a comic that is primarily written for women even going further than that for and about queer women and queer women of color, but women more broadly, I think, can relate to some of the experiences in this book, in this comic. And, uh, you know, like, it's one of those things where if this sounds like your cup of tea, I would just ignore the men's thoughts on it and try it because I thought it was fantastic. And yeah, it is kind of a slow burn where a lot of the action happens at the end. But I feel like the slow burn is important. You are building what you know about the characters, about their dynamic. You're building what you know about the issues in the town and where the place that they live is. And so I didn't mind that. Also, there's some critiques of the art style it seems like. I like the art style. I think it works for the themes of the book and uh, I don't know like a lot of those reviews just feel nitpicky to me because people are upset that this isn't a book for and about them. I don't know. It... So if it sounds up your alley try it. I think it's great. Lastly, as I said, this month I had two books that I gave six stars, which is what I give to a favorite of the year. I did talk about both of these books in two places, actually. I talked about them a little bit in my mid-month wrap-up, and I read both of them for the small booktubers pick my TBR reading vlog, which props to you guys for picking out two books that I wouldn't have expected necessarily to be favorite books of the year for me, but were. One of which I ended up buying a physical copy of after the fact. Uh, this is Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. Absolutely loved this. And the other one was Transcendent Kingdom by Ya Jesse, which I would like to own a physical copy of as well. This is one that I could see myself returning to again in the future. So there you go. Those are all of the books that I read in the month of July. Overall, I feel like it was a pretty strong reading month. I'm happy that I got a lot of things off my TBR that had been on there for quite a while. And I found a few new favorites, read some great books. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, Tell me about a book that somebody else picked out for you or convinced you to read that you ended up loving and it became a new favorite for you where maybe you wouldn't have expected to love it as much as you did but they apparently knew you better than you knew yourself. Tell me about a time that that's happened to you in the comments down below. If you like this video don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you next time.